joining us in studio right Talk now to sports. talk, man. Let's talk sports. Uh, we heard a lot from Jerry DePoto yesterday, Brandon. Quote, uh, I won't go there on Otani. 30 teams have interest in figuring out how he fits, end quote. So that was a lot that we learned. Yeah, so Otani to Seattle, let's <laughs> go. Otani to Seattle seems like totally what's happening. Um, no, Jerry DePoto was mum yesterday from the GM meetings in Scottsdale. He really didn't want to talk about Otani, really didn't want to talk about free agency. He said a free agency, we won't talk about any single free agent. We will take care of our business and tend to our garden and try to do it pretty quietly. Before we get into what you know they should be doing to tend to that garden, right. let's just talk about Jerry's actual responses. Did anything <laughs> stand out, A, and B, do you agree with his decision to just keep it tight-lipped? Yeah, I mean, I think that we've all seen that at times Jerry can kind of uh, get out over his skates a little bit and maybe overpromise. I, I think of the, the offseason ahead of the 2021 season and 2022 seasons where it seemed like they were going to maybe – do a little bit more than they wound up doing based on what he was saying. And obviously things change and, you know, Jerry doesn't control the budget. That's an ownership thing. And maybe sometimes he thought he was going to have a little bit more to play with than he actually did. You know, that, that part of it's unclear, but you, you're just kind of, kind of get yourself into trouble. A lot of times, if you're talking specifically about one guy, I was a little bit surprised how many GMs were really open to talking about Otani as much as they did. I was just reading Bob Nightingale's piece for USA Today. I mean, that guy had on the record comments from like eight to 10 president of baseball offs about Otani. I was like, what is going on? But I mean, he's the unicorn. He, he's the, he's the unicorn. He's going to define ML, this entire MLB off season. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I don't know how long he's going to drag it out. A lot of guys typically don't sign until January, February, but I yeah. could see Otani just being just as, you know, business oriented as he is. Wouldn't surprise me if he signed before Christmas. So uh, they don't um, they don't keep up with Tay Oscar decide, look, 20 million is what he was probably going to be asking is a bit too much. Right. Uh, the Mariners were second in the league when it comes to strikeouts. Tail was second on his own when it comes to individual strikeouts. I believe it's up to what, 210 last year was 100, what, 152 strikeouts or something like that. So um, he's gotten worse when it comes to strikeouts. Um, and when you're when you're trying to build a team that's based on power, um, you're going to have to give up a guy who strikes out a lot. Right. Like that. Right. Um, do you feel like this was the right move? You think they should have been patient with that? They're going to give him the 20 million. Just the whole Tay Oscar situation. What does BG think? Yeah, I I mean, it's I don't know if Tay Oscar is going to get more than 20 million a year. I think the, the qualifying offer is like 20.3. I don't know if he's going to get that per year annually. So I could see them maybe thinking it's an overpay, but also. Again, we don't we don't know how much money Depoto and the front office have to play with. It, would you want to have twenty million with Teoscar and run it back, or would you want to try to maybe upgrade a different spot and, and have it be someone who's a little more contact oriented? I mean, it, it wasn't just a Teoscar problem. Gino had over two hundred strikeouts last year. Also, they were numbers two and three in baseball behind Kyle Schwarber, and neither of them did enough offensively in terms of like RBIs and home runs and doubles to kind of offset that strikeout mm -hmm. rate. So you need somebody in there who can, who can put together a little bit more, you know, professional quality at bats on a regular basis. Th there are guys out there like that. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. Who was just with the Diamondbacks. If you want to go more veteran DH type, Justin Turner, JD Martinez, those guys kind of answer the bell in that sense too. So there are options for them to kind of fix that problem with their lineup. And I think that it was just a very clear indication that, Hey, like we're, we're just not comfortable with, with Teo at that price. And also there are different avenues that we can go towards to improving that strikeout, right? Because it was a huge problem. It wasn't just total strikeouts, but they struck out more with guys on pace with mm -hmm. runners in scoring position. That was ultimately their Achilles heel. And yeah, that absolutely needs to be upgraded. And if you don't think Tay Oscar is going to have a bounce back year, then unfortunately it is kind of time to go. What did you make of Ryan Divish yesterday on with Wyman and Bob saying that he thinks that the front office wants to win but is kind of risk averse, maybe afraid of taking chances? Are there opportunities in free agency that you think may be comfortable for the Mariners front office and still help this team? Yeah, the the three guys I just mentioned, I don't think any of those three guys are going to break the bank. Lourdes Gurriel Jr., J.D. Martinez, Justin Turner, the latter two, again, everyday DH type. So that's kind of its own conversation where they, How do they, they haven't to wanted that? to do that, right? They haven't wanted to have that everyday DH, but at the same time, the guys who've been rotating in there haven't been very good. So maybe you two ultimately have to do that to upgrade your lineup. So there, there are guys in there, and again, it's, it's not the best top-heavy class, you know, outside of Otani. It's not the deepest class when it comes to hitting. I think one of the things that you could also look at is 
we've seen them not spend on the hitting side in free agency, but we've seen them do that with pitching. They gave Robbie Ray a huge deal, and I think we we often forget about that just because he missed basically all of that last uh, this past season. He's going to miss half of this upcoming season. So maybe it's a situation where they trade a Miller or a Wu for one of those bats, whether it's a rental like Soto or Alonso, maybe a longer-term fit like a Nolan Gorman with the Cardinals, and then they go into the free agent market on the pitching side, and maybe that's where they're a little bit more comfortable. Man, I forgot my question. Gonna ask you. I was reading these text messages. <laughs> oh, oh, I got it. Boom. Um, what's what's their thinking with being opposed to an everyday DH? What what's the benefit, and then what are they sacrificing? So what the 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 idea with it was it, it was primarily an outfield thing. They they thought for the last few years, hey, we have four outfielders that we really like, and we want them all to play all the time. So the idea behind it was. Hey, maybe we have one guy who's not quite as good in the field. Like last year, that would have been Tay Oscar. The year before, it would have been Jesse Winker. And we play them primarily at DH, but we're able to rotate guys through to kind of keep them fresh. Mm -hmm. That was the thought process. But Jesse Winker stunk in 2021. Kelnick had his ups and downs, got hurt this past year, right? Tay Oscar up and down this past year. So that that's that's their rationale behind it. And clearly, that just hasn't worked. And, and in 2022, we saw... They went and got Carlos Santana, who was effectively just an everyday DH, and that worked out fairly well for them. Um, the the thing is, there there are guys on the market. You know, obviously, if you're signing Otani, he's he's your DH. Like that that is what it is. But Turner, uh, you know, I, I mentioned uh, JD Martinez. There there are other guys on the market that are probably DH only types. Like Jorge Soler, mm -hmm. it's a ton of home runs. Mm -hmm. He's got some strikeout too, but and he also is terrible <laughs> defensively in the outfield he's the guy you would probably sign to be an everyday dh so if the if the pure goal is just hey let's upgrade the lineup and we're focusing on the lineup then yeah like there is there shouldn't be any reason to be super opposed to having a guy that just dh is for you we're talking with brandon gustafson who covers seattle sports for seattlesports.com our station website and um brandon i know we have a lot of questions for you right now but my question is actually about your questions what's your single biggest question for the mariners heading into this offseason oh man i mean the the otani thing is it, it writes itself right but it, it kind of goes beyond that it's if, if they're genuinely interested in shohei otani and, and you say like let's just say shohei gets 50 million a year annually from whichever team that is right because money's not gonna be a problem for otani if he if he tells you he wants to go to your team you're yeah. going you're gonna pay up for him but if the mariners are genuinely interested in shohei otani and let's say it's that 50 million dollar mark just to have a number out there if they get close to the finish line but don't get him are you still comfortable giving your front office that money to go spend like that much money or are you restricting it down to me that's one of the big questions because i i do think that there's probably going to be genuine interest it's they were very interested in him when he came over in the first place i think a lot of people said they were probably runner up or, or bronze medal you know behind the angels for for getting him locked up so if they make a legit run at him and they're willing to give him that money if they don't get him i would still like to see them be willing to go out there and spend at least close to what you would have been giving him in a single season would you be willing to give us some young arms to go get a big talent it depends on the arm like what I, arms are you willing to give up i'm not willing to give up kirby or gilbert i'm not um i'd probably top of my list like in terms of giving him up i'd probably give up miller over Wu. i mm -hmm. think if Wu can hold up over an entire season i just think the secondary stuff is better than bryce miller's is at this point i think miller is one of those guys where you can kind of comfortably say like he's a number four or five starter which is still really valuable but he's someone who's going to go out there he's going to flirt with a quality start most of the time but because he's so fastball dependent and so in the zone He's a little bit more prone to, I think, blow ups and just getting hit around than maybe Wu is long term. So if someone out there is interested in a Bryce Miller or a Brian Wu and you can bring back, whether it's like a Soto or a Pete Alonso and it's just a one year rental, but it's like a legit star type talent. Absolutely. I, I'm and, and Marco Gonzalez and Emerson Hancock reportedly being ready for spring training helps me think that way, too. That's seven legit MLB starters with Robbie Ray on the horizon. So I would be more than comfortable giving him a, a, one of those two if it brings back a star level bat like that or someone who is younger but still relatively proven like a like a Nolan Gorman with St. Louis. The Mariners have not said this, but given the way that they like to build, which is to be a little more risk averse and to lean on draft and development, a lot of their own guys, do you think that uh, there's maybe some sentiment with the front office based on what you know about this team that that improvement will have to come from the pieces they have, that they're looking more at the pieces they have on being better than they are 
Texas Rangers style going to spend and buy a team. Yeah, I, and I, I think that was part of why they had the offseason they had last year, to be totally honest with you. I, I think they anticipated Julio and Cal and all these guys kind of just continuing to gel on top of, you know, the addition of Teoscar Hernandez. I think that on paper, they thought they had a better team last year than they did the year prior. And in some ways, that is debatable. But it, it took Julio a long time to really get going and get comfortable. Ty France and Gino never got going, and it took Cal a little bit too. JP was really the only consistent guy. So some of that growth is going to have to come internally. And I think if Julio's a star from day one, that changes a lot of things for, for your lineup instead of him kind of being hot, cold, hot, cold, and then just scorching for mm -hmm. a little bit and then cooling off right at the end. If you have a really consistent Julio with JP at the top, that does change things. But still, at the end of the day, you have – Probably, I count at least three holes with your lineup. I think both your corner outfield spots, DH, I think even second base and first base are a little bit of question marks just based on what you have and what you don't have and what you got from those guys last year. So even if you are depending primarily on that internal growth, like you still need to go out there and get an everyday bat or two, like at least. I'll say for guys like Dylan Moore and Haggerty. I, Moore is more safe in, in terms of just staying with the team. Uh, he he just signed that contract before last season. I think it's a three year deal, so he has mm -hmm. two years left. Ha Haggerty, I think, is out of minor league options, and and quite honestly, part of the appeal with him was, hey, he hits left handed pitching really well. Didn't really do that this past year. He did in twenty twenty two. Really didn't this past year. They never were able to really deploy him as that kind of super utility guy that that I think they anticipated. I Dylan Moore will be on the team. I think that. Based on what they currently have, it's probably a Rojas, Dylan Moore platoon at second base with Rojas getting the bulk of those since he faced more right-handed hitters. Sam Haggerty's got a little bit more of a struggle to, to make the roster, to be totally honest with you, especially just because of the the young corner outfielders that they, uh, outfielders that they have with Kelnick and, and Canzone that bring more of an offensive profile than Haggerty does. Um, kind of like a big existential question about team identity and, and how they want to build. Um, during the postseason um, press conference, Jerry Depoto and Scott Service were like, we need to make more consistent contact. Mm -hmm. We struck out way too much. We need to fix that. Then we see the first big move they make um, being to essentially part ways with Tay Oscar Hernandez, not extend him a qualifying offer. Tay Oscar struck out more than any other Mariners player except for Gino. So you can make the correlation that's really easy between like, look, they're moving, they're moving away from players that strike out a lot, or they clearly don't want to look for that player. Do you think something has fundamentally changed in how they view how they want to build? Because last year they were they they viewed Tay Oscar, I think, as their big offseason acquisition. Like that was the big piece that they were adding to bolster that lineup. And Tay Oscar didn't fundamentally change as a player. He he struck out a lot when he was, you know, with right. with the Blue Jays. But it seems like maybe they're changing their take on the type of player that they want. Yeah, I, I think it kind of goes back to what you said about being like risk averse. I think that they were willing to have a lot of those guys in the lineup with that kind of power. Yeah. But they but with that kind of strikeout, like they thought they would have enough to offset it. And with, with Gino, it's not just the power typically, but it's the walks. He was, I think, top 10 in walks in 2022. Didn't really have that same kind of number in 2023. So I think part of it was they, they thought there was going to be enough with that extra stuff, with this with the slug, with the walks to kind of offset a lot of that. Teoscar doesn't really walk. He never has. He probably never will be that kind of guy, but he was a guy that was always 500 plus slug and he just didn't have that. I mean, yeah. Gino had a sub 400 slug. Josh Rojas slugged more than Gino Suarez. Dylan Moore slugged more than Gino Suarez this past year. So when you have enough of those key guys in the middle of your lineup that just aren't contributing even close to the level that, that you need them to, it's a big problem. But I think, yeah, just they I think they think they have enough guys that can get on base and can do enough like a JP at the top of the lineup. You know, Julio's a star level player. Cal played really, really well this past season. I think they feel they have enough guys that can kind of get on base fairly consistently. They just need guys that can put the ball in play. And there were too many instances of just, you know, first and third, second and third, nobody out, one out, you strike out, and then that takes this out of play. You know, it takes a ground ball to the second baseman out of play for scoring a run. It takes a sacrifice fly out of play yeah. for scoring a run. And I think that just having that more consistent contact, yeah, they – they need less guys that strike out. That that that's really obvious. But I think it goes back to kind of what you said, just risk averse. I think that there may be a little bit more on their on their heels about like, okay, we can offset the power or we can offset the strikeout with the power. Maybe they're not just quite as confident about that. It sounds like there might be a philosophy change going on here a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. And you think that's for better or for worse? Oh, for better. I mean, the thing is, dominating the zone like like they they preach. They obviously didn't do that this past year because you you struck out too much. You didn't work enough walks. You didn't. Homer, I think some people think that 
dominate the zone, control the zone, whatever they want to call it, right, it is is so dependent on walks versus strikeouts. It's 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 mostly about doing damage on on your hot zones, on your pitches. Like some guys like the ball down, some guys like the ball up, some guys like the ball away in whatever. It's more about getting to good enough counts, you know, winning first pitch, winning 1-1 counts. Those are the two most important counts statistically in baseball, our first pitch and a 1-1 count. Winning those counts to get the pitches that you can handle is a big part of it. And that that part's not going to change. It's just they they found themselves behind 0-1, 0-2, 1-2, so often, whether it's because they were too aggressive, they were chasing too much, but they they do need to there there does stand to be maybe a little more, bit more patience, but there also stands to be guys that maybe are aggressive early in counts, but actually put the ball in play because they have a better idea of what they're doing.